Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're listening to me from. This is Larry Lewis again on the Mentors Lounge. Happy New Year to everyone. This is the first episode of the Mentors Lounge in the year 2022. And today I have with me a wonderful friend, a brother who has carved a great need for himself in the agri-tech sector in Africa. This person has done great things that has received world acclaim, right? It has received world acclaim such that um, it's making great impact within the agri-sector. So today, I have no other person but Olumide Ogumbanjo. Welcome, my brother, to Mentors Lounge. Thank you very much, Larry. And uh, let me use this opportunity to um, say a Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, I wish that this year will bring us joy and um, good tidings in Jesus' name. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Awesome. Now, people will be wondering who is Olumide. If you go to your Google and search for Olumide Ogubanjo, you'll be wowed with what Google will return to you. But well, usually when I bring my guests onto Mentors Lounge, I want them to speak themselves. So we'd like to hear from the horses about who is Olumide Ogubanjo? How did Olumide become what is known for today? Over to you. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Larry. Um, I, I think you know the story from the beginning anyway. Um, my name is Olumide Ogunbanjo, and um, I'm from Ogun State in Nigeria. That is very, very important. Um, I grew up um, in the rural landscape uh, in your State, uh, and my parents were farmers. And um, one thing that stood out for me was uh, the love for agriculture. So I was lucky enough to secure admission to the University of Ibadan, and I studied agricultural engineering. And along the line, I got a scholarship by the Ogun State government uh, through the um, OGD of our time, uh, Otuba Gwenga Daniel, which actually shaped my, my career and my outlook in life. Um, I studied sustainable agriculture at Coventry University. Um, and this was a, 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 a game-changing uh, point in my career. Um, at the time in the UK, I got a chance to work with um, Barclays Bank and some other different organizations, learning the culture. Um, the purpose of that scholarship at that time was to develop workforce for Ogun State. And I think it did justice to it because I returned back to Nigeria and I worked with the Ministry of Agriculture in Ogun State. Uh, I rose to the position of a principal agriculture officer. And during this time, I was able to have direct interrelationship with uh, the farmers, looking at uh, the problem in the agri sector. And um, this actually put all the pieces together from what became of me today. Uh, I run an organization today called AgroData, which is a social enterprise in the agri-tech field. And um, it's a sum total of all what I've experienced from my youthful days studying agriculture in the University of Ibadan to uh, my time of studies in the UK and the work experience I gained working in the Ministry of Agriculture in Oakland State. So that's just the bottom line of myself. Thank you. Right. Awesome. Olumide is just being modest with his introduction. I must tell you that. He's being very modest. He's a humble man. He does not want to blow his trumpet. But I'm going to zoom in into this uh, very shortly. Because on the Mentors Lounge, our goal is to democratize success. Is to make success normal by bringing people who are mentors, who have been able to chart a course even in a particular field, in a particular sector, in a particular area, so that people who desire to do something similar, not necessarily what they have done, they will be able to learn some strategies from our guests. So my next question is, Olumide, how did you get the idea of agrodata? How did you get okay. to the point where you now use technology to solve some problems in agriculture? Thank you very much, Larry. Yeah, um, that, that's a very interesting question. 
Um, like I said before, I have passion for Greek. I grew up in an Greek um, setup, and um, I've always loved farming. Um, apart from studying agricultural engineering and uh, probably sustainable agriculture, uh, I have the opportunity to work with farmers directly. And one thing I discovered is there are challenges, right from the use of the land, to finance, to a lot of things. But you cannot just do everything. You have to do one thing. And um, looking at technology, technology is an enabler. It will help you to solve a lot of problems. But you should know the problem in and out before you can use technology to do it. Um, the story of AgroData started when I was doing my field work in Coventry University and I came to Nigeria to gather some data to be used for my MSc dissertation. And I had some issues, I had some problems navigating the Agri Research Institute and collating data. And during the course of my thesis, I made a recommendation. In fact, number one recommendation was to create an agricultural database for Nigeria. So this is where that name actually originated from, Agro Database. So it was sh uh, shortened to Agro Data. Well, did I do that? No. Um, in the course of starting it as a business, um, I think I was explaining this to some people in, in my last um, interview that there's one thing you want to do there's another thing that I have to look at the business model does it generate income how do you how do you bootstrap how do you make it evolve to become a, a business an income generating business so the idea of agro data and the fanciful name came from uh, trying to create an agricultural database for Nigeria which I think I still think we're still going to do um, but we evolve um, after I left the ministry to focus on this on full time, um, we evolved to our wonderful insects, the honeybees. And uh, we became a beekeeper, we became a honey merchant. And from there, we've been able to move from the traditional way of beekeeping to a digital beekeeping now, creating a smart hive, which is an IoT, and um, which we have patent for at the moment. And um, we've got different awards for that. And um, we are leveraging on using artificial intelligence and um, uh, machine learning to perfect this and to make things work in the agri sector. Uh, an interesting part of our model is that we, we, use, we look at the small water farmers as key partners. Um, our mission is not just to produce honeys or to keep honeybees, but we are looking at biodiversity. We are looking at helping in crop yield a major um, challenge to tropical farming in this part of the world is yield. When you hear Nigeria is the largest producer of cassava or the second largest producer of cocoa, you will think we're doing well. I'm sorry to say this. We are just the largest producer because of the numbers, not because of productivity. We are not productive. If you look at the area of land that we are using to produce cassava, compared to other parts of the world, you'll be shocked that we're not supposed to be called the largest producer because we are looking at the large land area. That is the leverage for us. But productivity per hectare or per hectare of land is almost zero. The farmers go to the land, put fertilizers, put everything year in, year out. And um, if you want to define the poorest set of people in Nigeria today, you go to the rural area and point at the farmers. Uh, if truly we are the largest producers and the farming is good, as everybody is claiming, then a typical farmer should be able to live more than a, a dollar a day. Uh, but the reverse is the case. So productivity is a major thing. And uh, what my company, AgroData, is doing is to increase productivity, improve livelihood, and um, we'll make a business out of it. Uh, we'll look at the process um, carefully. Uh, we've been able to um, zoom into fruit and vegetable farming and uh, we'll bring these these honeybees as pollinators um we'll place these beehives there and uh, interestingly you get improvement in yield because the basic thing of germ uh, seed germination and seed production is pollination and um, with a careful ecosystem with a careful arrangement of things you could actually make some magic in the rural areas in the farming area 
So, um, I think I'm overshooting my the question. The, the good thing about it is, for you to be able to use technology to solve a problem, then you must know that problem in and out. You must be nice. part of that problem. You mm. cannot be outside the problem and create a solution. You mm. will just be creating solutions for yourself. Mm. The solution should be customer centric. It should be from mm. the user's point of view, not the mm. um, initiator or the inventor. You don't just sit in your office and think, oh, I think if I create this, it will be useful for these people. No, you have to be mm. there and experience what they're experiencing, see the difficulties they are going through, then think, how can I use this technology to help them? I can tell you there's a lot of challenges in every aspect, especially agriculture, that technology can help. We've not even touched, we've not even started at all. There are a lot of opportunities, a lot of bottlenecks, uh, post harvest losses, a lot of things that we need technology for. But we cannot do this from the drawing board. You have to be in the farming communities, you have to talk to them, you have to see what they are passing through. Then being able to go back to your team and think of how you can help. Then when you have the solution as a prototype, you go back to them and try it out. You're going to do a lot of iteration, you're going to do a lot of pivoting before you can get to the final product. We didn't just start with um, Smart Hive. We started yeah. with just traditional beekeeping, but today we've been able to digitize beekeeping mm. in Nigeria. Okay, awesome. Now, um, I'm going to zoom in further in this area. You were you are recently recognized as an I Fear Israel Nigeria Fellow for this innovation. And um, this is something that um, is uh, was organized by Israel in Nigeria and the office of the Vice President, Professor Yemil Shebaju. Now, the question I want to ask is this. Having been recognized at that level, right, what do you think you, can be done? Because you've identified so many issues with uh, the smallholder farmers, with, uh, with yield and so many things, with the land area being used for agriculture and so many other things like that. How can states that have good land, how can this your technology handshake with these states, agricultural, maybe ministries or stuff like that, so that we have better yields in those states? Like in Nigeria, you have Benue as the food baskets of the nation. But we also know that Southwest states have very good uh, land for, for uh crop production or things like that how can this thing be scaled because what i always look at is in 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 africa we don't amplify our own very well this your solution is really good but if it is scaled to the state's level that is not political how can this thing because if this thing can be amplified to all the state level then we are actually going to increase production and that can bring out the cost of uh, of food. So, I mean, that's my question for you on that area now. Okay, uh, th thank you very much for that question. That's very very important. Um, we we got um, the support from the Israel, uh, uh, the embassy of the state of Israel in Nigeria through the IFR program, and the prototype of the smart hive was actually uh, done at the Innovate Hub uh, in Abuja, and um, we. We passed through the prototype to the minimum viable product and we we're able to do the field testing and um, we, we got a working prototype. And to look at how can this thing be done in such a way that we can have influence, especially with the ministries, departments and agencies and um, um, agricultural agencies in Nigeria. Um, looking at it from a point of view that we, we decided to focus. Um, when you talk of a solution to agriculture, mind you, agriculture is wide, is broad. You have crop yeah. production, you have animal production. In crop production, you have probably maize, cassava, you have fruits, you have vegetables. And we have a lot of research institutes in Nigeria that are doing wonderful things. Um, for me, I think for fruit and vegetable farming, with honeybees that we are trying to introduce, we've got a magical solution. I'll tell you this. In the U.S., in California, uh, mm. there is uh, this concept they use for almond 
almond is grown widely in California, and mm. they use the honeybees to pollinate them. Mm. You you will be surprised if you go on Google and put that information in California and uh, almond pollination. They they have to ship beehives with honey honeybees in them from different parts of the U.S. during the the, the, the season, and the the beekeepers make more money on the pollination than even on the honey on the production. honey production. Yes. Mm. Now, what am I saying? Looking at it from my own point of view, what can we learn from there? Uh, in my company, we've been able to do some research work and uh, do some field testing. And we discover if you put um, beehives in cashew plantation, for example, you're going to double your yield, 100%. Wow. wow. Now, you can put it in oil palm. You can put it, so long there are fruits and there are pollens, there are going to be nectar, anything fruity. That's why we zoom into fruit and vegetables. So the way out is this. We are working on a commercial agreement with some partners and uh, we are hoping uh, we'll get some leverages um, to be able to plow this into government agencies and um, some ministries to look at establishment, for example, forest reserves. Um, from Ogun State, for example, there's a large forest reserves um, where the Ministry of Forestry is actually handling. Uh, these boxes can be placed in these um, areas and we can encourage agroforestry. Um, I'm aware of a project um, that was conceived uh, during the time uh, I was in the Ministry of um, Agriculture and um, I was partly shuttling between the Ministry of Forestry and the Ministry of Agriculture and it was called Iledotu. Uh, mm. it's, uh, it's a re reclamation reclamation project. I think okay. from the minister from the from the French from the French uh, French government and Ogun State. Uh, it's a massive project. If you, if you Google Iled Dotun, and uh, it was supposed to reclaim the forest areas and to make um, uh, um, rural area uh, the, the rural rural area more viable. It's a big project. Uh, if you look at this and you look at the southwest, for example, even the southeast, there are a lot of forest area. If you travel on the Padon to Lagos Expressway, you see a lot of forest this side and this side, and practically you're not doing anything out of it. We could make yeah. a lot of things in this. If you go to the US, for example, go to the Netherlands, and you will see how how massive how massive the agriculture is. They're not looking at agriculture from two acres or three acres. Massive land. This is what we need. Uh, currently now we're having food shortages, we're having issues with high prices of food. But the way to go is to look at how we can do this thing in a sustainable way. The government needs to come and invest or probably do a public-private partnership with organizations such as myself and some other people that have solutions to this. We could increase our production of pineapple, cucumber, watermelon massively to the point that we we'll start exporting. That's the way to go. Um, until we start adding forest from forex from um, agri, like in the days of Aolo or Cocoa House, then we've not done anything. When I was growing up in, 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 in our, in our um, what's it called, textbooks, we used to see the pyramid, granite pyramid uh -huh. in, in the north. Yep. We used to see cocoa. We used to hear about rubber in the east and hoi palm. All of them are gone, but we can reactivate this thing. We can bring about, bring, bring about life into agriculture. We can make agriculture more interesting again. Now, for us at AgroData, we've decided to focus on this um, fruit and vegetables and we've, we've come about we've come out with about 10 different um crops in these areas that we can actually use the honeybees to pollinate and to increase their yield and let me also tell you this you're going to reduce your overhead costs um almost 60 percent to 70 percent of the overhead cost in agriculture or farming in this part of the world is for fertilizer um the farmers spend a lot on fertilizers. fertilizers. Uh, yes. For us, we are not saying don't use fertilizers. We are not against fertilizers, but we are saying control the use and minimize it. Because in the long run, if you know about soil conservation very well, you're actually harming the soils. You are harming the, the microorganisms in the soil. You're killing them. Because for example, the case study is this. If you have one acre of land and you plant on it for 10 years, if you go back to year one and go and calculate the volume of fertilizer you use, then compare it to year 10, 
you would discover that you have probably uh, multiplied your fertilizer usage by 10 times or 20 times or 50 times. Now, the lambda is going to respond to you by the volume of fertilizer you put. So if you put one 25 kg of fertilizer in one acre of land, then you get this yield. Our farmers have been brainwashed that the more you put fertilizer, the more you get yield. So it's now giggle, garbage in, garbage out. And go and look at the quality of the product. Compare it to a naturally grown product, which they call organic. Now, we are not pushing for 100% organic because it's a bit expensive for certification purpose. But we are pushing that, okay, if we are we do something with our farmers. We have close to 3,000 farmers on our network now. So we do um, um, data management and information management with them. We use GIS to help them map their land area. A typical Nigerian farmer doesn't know his acreage. He will just tell you from yeah. that tree to that tree, from that tree to yeah. that tree. Now we use GIS, we do mapping because our beehives have GPS on them. So if you put four yeah. boxes in your farm, we can actually get your farm area for you. you can uh, geomap it using GIS for you and uh, remote sensing. Now you actually now know that I have 3.5 acres of land. Good. Okay. Now we, we we encourage them and we use our extension agents to document their inputs and outputs. When I mean inputs, what are they buying? What are you bringing into the farm? Because now if you want to calculate productivity, you must do it from a point of input and output. You can't just do it because you produce 1,000 kilograms of cucumber and you said, oh, I'm the largest producer of cucumber. What land area did you use to produce it? What resources did you use to produce it? So this is what AgroData has been able to do in the last three years, bringing about uh, documentation and helping the farmers to realize that I can make more money from this land by introducing fruit and vegetables along with my natural maize and cassava. Because I can tell you, uh, we are in a saying, in our your states. Uh, yeah. When we started, we had strong issues with adoption. People are yeah. running away from bees, people are running away from fruit and vegetables. They just want to plant cassava. Everybody wants to plant cassava. Everybody wants to plant maize. And look at cassava, for example. The shortest germination or uh, maturity is probably nine months. So that yeah. means for the next nine months, you are going to tie down that land. And that land, land is going to just have probably cassava on it. But look at Ugu, for example, and look at how fast you can turn over money on Ugu, how yeah. fast you can turn on watermelon, on different kind of all these vegetables. In fact, there are vegetables yeah. you can do for three weeks, although with irrigation. Now, what we are trying to say is this. Now you are bringing in crop rotation, which is a basic agricultural principle. Uh, in, in our secondary school at Greek, we were told that you could have different kind of crops on your land and you could rotate them. You have the leguminous mm. one, you have the one that fixed nitrogen back to the soil. Mm. All these are what we need to do. So as a farmer and you probably have five acres of land or three acres of land, you could map your land carefully. Look at your input mm. and output, look at how you can optimize this land and make mm. more money. Um, mm. I have a friend, um, he always made this quotation that farming should not be seasonal. Because one of the problems of tropical, tropical agriculture is seasonal farming. We and wait on farm. the rains. Mm. We, don't, we, we, we don't do anything. Everybody will be praying, oh God, when is rain going to come this year? Now, that guy said, farming should not be seasonal because hunger is not seasonal. Yeah. So now, the way, to do, the way to go about it now is to look at different kind of uh, approaches which uh, different people in the agri sector are doing. There are people doing soilless farming, uh, doing greenhouse, lovely ideas. Now, but for us, we have streamlined into looking at our traditional farms. How can we optimize the land? Uh, an average smallholder farmer will have roughly about close to two acres of land. And hmm. you can actually make money from this for your family and uh, to be able to have a good livelihood. A farmer should be able to have not peasant farming. Peasant farming is gone. It's for the hmm. old age. Um, Akimomi Adeshina said farming should be a business. It's not a culture. Yeah. We, should, we should leave the cultural part of farming to one side and face it as a business. If you want to face it as a business, then you must be able to generate income for yourself for your family and for your employee. Um, for us in AgroData, we have to pay salaries, we have to make money, we have to turn around things. So we think about it as a business. 
So the, the way to go about it now is to look at this thing and look at it from the point of view of a business. If you have a business, you will have your cash flow, you have your input, you have your output. You must be able to make money. If you don't make money, then it's not a business. It's probably an hobby, it's probably just for fun. So agriculture should be centered around the business. The model should be that you want to make money. You don't want to tie the land down for nine months. You don't want to tie the land down for one year. You can make money every month from your land. I have not talked about the only part of the business. I've talked about the pollination. Yeah. For your information, Nigeria still imports honey. What? Nigeria imports honey. I can tell you that for free. So the local mm. production is not even enough to go around what we need domestically. What? So and this is an industry that can turn around a lot of things for us. The honey is being used as a raw material in pharmaceuticals, in a lot of other things, uh, other mixtures. And I, 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 I'm, I'm shocked that with uh, natural resources, we could still be importing honey. It's, it's, okay. It's, 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 it's shocking to know that. Okay. Now, I, I'm going to ask about two or three questions around this thing now. The first one I want to ask is this. Let's say somebody, a young person, um, or maybe middle age, is watching this and is wondering, okay, um, I think I can acquire some acres of land. I think I want to take the shot. I want, I want to plunge into this thing that Olumide is sharing today. What can you advise first about getting um, your support to about following a particular framework that will guarantee a uh, sustainable farming. That is, the person is actually earning money for himself, Wonderful. sustaining his family, and also having some reserve. What can you advise? What kind of um, of, of uh, um, crops or whatever vegetables or that you advise? That okay, if you have this, you can turn it over in this period. This is what we can do, right? I want you to speak into that. Okay, good. We we have working models that we've been able to um, come out with our experiences. We've tried different kind of uh, combinations, uh, crop combinations with the bees. Uh, we've tried different kind of how many number of beehives to be placed on a plot of land on an acre, and we have different results. Uh, we've been able to do this in the last three years, and in our fourth year of operation last year, uh, we optimized making looking at which one will give you the best results um for someone that want to look look at it from an investment point of view uh, yeah a preferable option is to look at beekeeping with um regular fruits like watermelon and cucumber uh you could add pineapple to it but for a start you need something that will give you that will generate uh, returns in good time for yourself and um, beekeeping for example will take you for the first three months to six months uh, before you can harvest uh, you need roughly like three months to set the ecosystem in, in place uh, during this during this time you can actually start harvesting your vegetables uh, you could do a lot of other things uh, but it's always good to start with what is um, been validated and also the area also is very important. Um, we call the southwest the southwest, the south is southeast. Uh, but there are some climatic conditions we also also look at. Um, you have to think about the issue of irrigation. Uh, if you are going to do this and wait for the natural rain and all this thing to come, it might not really be useful. We all know about climate change. Things are not working the way it should work. So you should make sure you are providing adequate resources water is very essential for uh, plant growth so irrigation and for us we've been able to partner with some uh, local uh, agri engineer engineering companies and we're able to uh, beat down the cost of irrigation we do drip irrigation now using basic materials you don't need to either spend too much on sprinkling systems and um, filling okay. bowls no a basic well we do because a drip irrigation actually conserves water it only drops in drips to the the, the required. what is required and i tell people this also 
Yes, and as other people this also, if you look at the morphology of plant very well, it's the root system that needs the, the water, not the leaves. Yeah. So you don't need to spray it on the leaves, drop it into the soil, into the roots, and it's going to be efficient for them. So, and also our, our beehives now has, uh, part of the sensors we put is, is a soil moisture detector, uh, which will actually tell you uh, whether you need more water based mm. on what is sensed in that area. Uh, mm. We have so many sensors in one box now. It's it's mm. um, another, another organization called our, our beehive, our smart beehive, a weather box, because it could actually tell you what is going on in that local micro environment. Uh, it could sense the your relative humidity. It could tell you this is what is going on. And on our dashboard now, we're trying to create something that could actually look a farming a, a farmer or probably um, a, a averagely educated person can look at his phone and from your phone or from your laptop you can see what is happening on the farm you can know when your boxes are due to be harvested what quantity of honey did you expect to go and harvest on the field before you go so these are these are the way we are looking at solving the problem with this uh, unique farming system bringing okay. the honeybees as pollinators deliberately into the farm and i can also say this that we're working on some uh, new uh, concepts not really new but we're bringing them into this environment uh, stingless bees um for people that have fear of being of bees stung yeah. by a bee there are bees that produce honey and they are stingless although um, we're working on that research um and ho hopefully before this year runs out, we should be able to launch it in a commercial uh, quantity. So in urban beekeeping now, people can now think of putting the boxes on their rooftop. Um, for my friends in the soilless farming, uh, putting the boxes, because almost 100% of what is planted in soilless farming and um, uh, what's it called, greenhouses, are fruit and vegetables. And these are, most of them are pollinated by bees. And we could actually introduce these boxes into um, our environment. Uh, a normal house, a normal garden in a house could have fruit and vegetable being planted. What you're going to eat, you could have it on your in your farm, in, in your compound, I mean. And at the same time, you could have the stingless bees with a the box there and make your own honey. Um, I watched some video recently on YouTube in which people, what they eat, they produce it. So you, you could actually look at a circular economy around that and um, you are okay. able to generate uh, fruits and vegetables from your garden, home garden, and honey. Okay. So this will actually go in a way to help the uh, food security uh, issue. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. So the second question I wanted I wanted to ask in that regard is, you mentioned that um, the honey um, being produced in Nigeria is not sufficient, such that. Nigeria selling port honey. And there are cases of adulterated or fake honey. I mean, um, when I was young, much younger, my mother would say that if you want to know an original honey, take a mash stick, put it inside it, and try to strike it. Fire test. Yeah. The fire test will fire tell test. you that it's, it's, it's original, that an original honey will still strike and the fire will come out. Now, where I'm going with this is this. If the only uh, being produced is not enough, and we all know the health advantage of honey, or the health benefits of honey, um, apart from somebody who wants to go into agriculture, uh, vegetables and pollination using honey, what about somebody who says that, okay, I think I also want to replicate this thing that all of me is doing. I want to be producing honey. Now, I'm not in that area. I'm not in that space. But is honey production also in terms of acreage? Or is it just a small space and you produce more? And can you break it down in terms of when you talk about, do you need acres to produce large quantity? How many tons or how many liters can you produce? What is the production cycle? How long does it take? Okay. Is it in three months? Is it one month? You know, break this thing down so that anybody that is interested in this thing can actually say that, okay, I, I think I'm interested in this and I would like to reach out to Lumidi. Yeah. So, uh, okay. kindly break that down. 
you've done a wonderful job with that question. That's a powerful question. I, I'll start with the adaptation part of it. There was yeah. a time on Twitter that a popular Nigerian artist actually went on Twitter to ask that, are there, are there people really producing honey in Nigeria that so much of adulteration? Mm. Let, me, let me try and give a bit of my own understanding to that. Um, 80% of uh, the honey, or let's say, honey, let, let's be more conservative, let's say probably 60% of the honey that we, we, we're producing actually come from the forest. These are not yes. um, bees that have been. Uh, they, are, they are not under husbandry. They are not. They are just the wild bees. In they the are forest. not cultured. They are not uh, cultured for it. They are not. Yes. 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 L let me give you a good example to uh, to explain this. It's like you want to buy king rat or bush meat, mm. and you are driving on the express, and you see one young boy just bring it and hunt it. Too. Now yes. he just goes into the forest and poach it and kill it. Yes. So, Almost 60 to 70 percent of the honey we are buying and using, are consuming, are coming from the natural forest, and it's sad to know that this is destructive agriculture. It is destructive wow. in the sense that before you can get this honey, you have to chase away the bees. You oh. kill some of them and chase them away. Take their hives, and you use this hive. Uh, you crush it and you make this honey from it. The wow. sad experience is this, for people in, involved in this kind of agriculture, or this kind of business, they're making money, but they discover that the efforts they put into going go into the forest area to look for this honey, and the honey they get in return is so small, it doesn't relate, it doesn't correspond it's not with the commercial efforts. quantity. So they, yeah. yeah, so the only option for them to make money is to have a tray to put something to it because uh, they didn't put boxes anywhere they just go into the forest area they know oh in this area uh there are honey here so hmm. they get these things maybe they spent days or hours and they come out and they see just one cake just 20 liters or 25 liters after a whole day labor hmm. the only option for them is to adulterate it and uh, because of the cultural aspect of beekeeping and um, the use of honey they, there are a lot of um what's it called uh, different kind of thing that can be added to it in our home we tried our own to see how this thing works some people had sugar cane some people had different kind of flavors and uh, it's it's just unimaginable um there are pure honey there are cave honey there are white honey there are different kind of bees honey bees uh, because the only bees also comes in their own species and varieties and oh. what they feed on the time oh. also the the, the, the the flavor of the flavor of the honey so you oh. might see for example our brand is fresh dew honey and we have about three different um variation based on the areas in which we harvest this honey uh the best for us is probably the white honey uh, i'm, I'm right. sure that not everybody has seen the white honey but we have white honey that's the purest. Mm. If you do the lab analysis, that gives you the purest form. Uh, mm. Then followed by the golden color. Then the the, mm. the the most common one is the dark color. And I tell people, we don't push for the dark color, do we get them, but we don't actually yeah. bottle them. Because the dark color is easier to adulterate. When you oh. add something, one sugar into a dark color, it's going to be dark. It's going to be dark and you can manage it. But if you have, if you have a white honey or a golden color honey, the moment you add something to it, it's going to it's show. show because it's not going to mix properly. And also for the test you mentioned, let me quickly say this. Honey is a very strong um, substance. And once you have a little quantity of honey in a, a large um, uh, vessel or a large, uh, for example, if you have uh, original honey of just one liter, yeah. uh, roughly one point something cake, and you take uh, 10 liters of a yeah. liquid and you pour that one liter into it, I can tell you that one liter will have so much effect after a period of time on the 10 liter. The whole 11 liter will not become pure honey, but it will have all the properties, most of the properties of honey. So the fire oh. test we are talking about is likely that it will beat that test. The ant test, oh. all the tests that is known. Um, oh. There was um, an experiment we carried out with people that hawk honey. Um, I don't want to mention the tribe. Some people hawk honey and they will not be shouting pure honey, pure honey. Now look at them. When they bring the 
basin or the container out. If you look into the container, you will see the beehives, uh, the, 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 the bee colony. It's yes. wax and the other things still inside. Now, why didn't they remove it? Normally, when you are extracting honey, when you take that from the hive, you remove it and you extract it out. It's supposed to be a waste product. Yeah. Now, they deliberately left it in the container because they wanted to continue to give power to the liquid that they've mixed. Ooh. And most times, when you now tell them to do the fire test, they will take it as close as possible to that. To that. They will, you understand what I mean? <laughs> yes. Because that's the source of the energy. Of the that's energy. the source of the of the of the energy of, of of the flow of the honey because if you put little quantity of honey in a substance maybe you had for example water to eat for example honey contains water so i said honey actually contains some um, quantity of water it is known yeah. and now if you take a, a sample of honey let's say just like um, a liter and you take another five liter of water for example and you mix it to it and you give it time over time this new substance you've been able to create, we start behaving like honey. Because oh. the power of honey is so much that it will have influence on it. The, the only difference is, if you take time, I always tell people when you buy honey, uh, take a little quantity in a, in, in a, probably in a small container, and go and place it in a place you will not touch at all. Give it like maybe three weeks or one month, and go oh. and take it again. There will be there will be separation. The honey oh. is denser than water; it will go down. Mm. The any other thing they had will come as it will come up. Come up, float. Yeah, it will float. It might not be too much, but you see some float. Then on the container, if you look up on the container, you see some kind of reactions. You see some kind of uh, different deposits showing. So that these are the kind of thing you mix. If it's pure and original honey. There will not be any form of sedimentation or any form of reaction. Uh, for for example, uh, the Egyptian Egyptian um, mummies, uh, the Egyptian mummies were preserved by honey, uh, because mm. honey does not actually, it doesn't get destroyed, doesn't get expired. Uh, for us, we got naphtha for our fresh dew honey, and um, naphtha had to force us to put two years expiry on it. But natural mm. honey does not. It does raw honey does not expire. No, no, it's so it's it's, right. it's it's a massive um, natural uh, substance that could be used. Okay. So for people that want to start it as a business, you want to go yeah. into beekeeping and uh, making honey as a business. Yeah. Now for issue of acreage, you could actually do what they call vertical farming with beekeeping. Vertical farming yeah. is a kind of farming that does not look at the land area, but it looks at the space. For example, you could do. On one plot and decide that okay here i'm going to make it a bee yard a bee farm okay. and you can stack okay. the boxes instead of spreading the boxes uh, horizontally on the land and you can stack it that's okay. called vertical farming so proper beekeeping uh with um, good planning does not need uh acreages it does not right. need you to have 25 acres 30 acres but i'll sign a, a, a note of warning yeah uh with my interactions with the beekeepers and people that love beekeeping they don't ever think about what the bees are going to consume they only think about making boxes and making honey and my question is this the same thing that happened to cattle rearing in nigeria in which our beloved cattle rearers bought cattle bought everything and just put them on the streets to be eaten that's what you're doing before you start beekeeping Think about what these bees are going to consume. And these are the fruits and the vegetables because they need the nectar. They need the All flowery right. part of plants. All this is right. what they use in regurgitating and what they actually what, what we call honey is actually the food that they store. They are they are uh, very hardworking like ants. So what they do is that um, be, they don't go out every time and they have their queen and their drones and their, their uh, structure to feed. So the workers go around looking for pollens and they bring these pollens back to their lives. They prepare it and they make it and they store it as a storage for themselves. It's their food. They consume it. 
So okay. if you want to go into beekeeping and you want to do it in such a way that for commercial purpose, you might not need large expense of land, but you need a space of land to plant these flowery plants, which could be uh, fruits and vegetables, right. that they will feed on. You don't expect so them to go into your neighbor's compound and be so looking for flowers there and start it's singing. Basically, <laughs> that means it's basically a symbiotic ecosystem. Yes. Um, the vegetables provide the food for them. They're also yes. helping the vegetables to grow. To grow, yes. Oh boy. This is That's wonderful. how it works. That's how it works. Okay. Okay. Then in that case, in that case, if that is the case, right? Um from your from your field work and working with uh, farmers, right? Um what will now be the most the the most or the uh, minimum sustainable acreage? for vegetables and the honey production. Because if this is the case, Technical, if this is the way, if this yeah. way this thing works, then it means that the person that wants yes. to go into this thing must think of doing vegetable farming plus uh, bee production. Because they work hand well, in hand. This one is feeding this, yes. this one is feeding this one. Yes, yes, yes. So well, what is um, the minimum? So to yeah. be very sincere, it mustn't actually be fruits and vegetables. Because if you look at the natural environments, there are trees like eucalyptus and some other trees that has flowers too. So the the honeybees go around, they move by smell and sound, not by sight. So they go around looking for nectar, looking for pollen in different aspects of uh, the natural vegetation. So now because you are making it a business, you don't just want to plant trees to feed them and yeah. get nothing from the trees. So you are planting fruits and vegetables. Uh, you are deliberately doing that because you can also make money from it. Now, when yeah. you look at the minimum, um, I, I could say technically for um, for a start, like starting like a hobby, um, yeah. and a normal land that we use in building houses is like half plot of a land half plot of a land uh, okay. I think a plot is roughly 100 by 50 uh, yeah. in feet now half of that half of that um, size, half of a plot will be enough to start the experiment or to start the business of beekeeping with fruit and vegetables so what you need to do is that one segment of the land you put the boxes there and the other places you plant the uh, fruit and vegetables there then you need shade so you might need to find a way of planting um, a kind of crop or trees that will, shrubs that will go, grow quickly to give you the shade because you will need um, a, a form of shade okay. you're trying to set up what is called orchard orchard is the word for it okay. where you actually have uh, some not too tall trees uh, growing right. and you can put the boxes under them then you have okay. your uh, other field where you plant it. So I would say the minimum is probably half of a plot or a plot. Um, All right. And you could make it commercial. On a plot of land, um, I can say this, that you could actually uh, make it a business. Uh, on 100 by 50, you could have as much as uh, uh, 20 boxes. And you mm. could have, you, you, could, you could plant ugu and make money on ugu every three, three months. You could make money on watermelon from just one plot. So it's not going on acreage. An acre is about six plots of land. So yeah. if you have one over six of an acre, you could actually start making money. So from that 20 boxes, what is the quantity of honey that can be produced? Okay, now, um, this uh, the beekeeping uh, business is the longer it stays. In those days when we were in UI, when we, when we, when we <laughs> tried to prepare a stew, we're engineering students at that time and we don't like cooking. So, but we like to say that the, the soup, the longer it stays, the sweeter it becomes. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> now, for a beehive, the longer the beehive stays in the ecosystem, the yield increases. Because okay. um, the, the, the queen actually lay eggs and the fertile males mm. fertilize the eggs. And mm. the more uh, of this wonderful insect you have, the more the colony will flourish. So All when right. you set up uh, a, bee, a a two feet bi, for example, in the first two weeks, you're not going to see much activities there. You're probably going to see some scouts, which are the 
workers and the drones moving around it, looking at whether it's con a conducive place to bring their queen, if they want to bring their queen, uh, or for other people that raise queens. There are beekeepers now that raise queen. They raise mm. queen for you to come and buy. Just like you're doing poultry and you're buying layers to come and lay eggs. Yeah, there are people yeah. that do it now. So now you could have your queen now placed in the box and expect how to be laying eggs and the fertile male to be fertilizing and things to be moving. So long the ecosystem is right, um, there's no um, pesticides being used, low uh, fertilizers. Now, in three months, give or take, all things being equal, you'll be able to harvest from that box. And in right. first harvest, it's always very small. And right. that's the way we do it. We don't harvest all the honey. Okay. We decide to keep at least a quarter of it there. Because mind okay. you, we have fruit and vegetables on the farm that we want them to work on. So we don't yeah. want to stop them by harvesting everything to zero. For them to yeah. start all over again, all over again. the workload yeah. on them will be too much. So we have it right. like 75% of the box will deliberately leave 25% down. So looking right. at that, we're looking at from a two feet, two feet um, beehive in the first three months, you could get as much as 10 liters, 15 liters, or 20 liters okay but this will increase over time mm. in our in some of our model farms in uh is saying now we have boxes that have stayed uh there are particular boxes supplied to us by international beauties they are part of our early funders and mm. um, they've been there since 2017 mm. and they are four feet long boxes wow. we get wow. as much as 60 liters 70 liters from one of them Wow. And wow. this is in cycles of 8 to 12 weeks, continuous cycle. Oh, oh okay. okay. So you could have a sustainable way in which you know that um, in the next two weeks, I'm going to the farm and I'm going to harvest. Then right. you look at another portion. In the next two, you could do it in such a way that you are setting up, you don't set up all the boxes at once. You give, you give time so that when you're harvesting one, the other one is going on. You could have your harvest right. schedule that every week you're harvesting honey. So, technically speaking, we could go with half of a plot or just one plot. And um, mm. you could make a business out of this. That's interesting. Very interesting. Okay. Now, I want to go back to some uh, background information. You know, everybody that, everybody like watching this, go and Google, Olumi Deo Gubanjo. Ha! This guy has done a lot of things. So does it mean it has always been smooth all, all this while? Definitely not. So uh, the question I want to ask you is just to help someone. That okay, the person that you are watching today has been able to overcome this, right? Because that's the beauty of mentorship. That look, I'm here now, but this is actually what I went through. Are there moments in this in this journey of growing agrodata to what it is today, of winning different fellowships, of winning funding? Are there moments where you messed up or you took a decision that went went south? And it's it's like it turned everything upside down for you. How did you overcome it? That you're still able to stand. We need to talk about that also. Yeah, this is this is really the emotional part of <laughs> of the whole of the whole thing um i will be very sincere with you it it hasn't been smooth it has been up and down and then um, there are some learning curves that i yeah. personally discovered i have uh, been able to um, learn from there are some difficult challenge uh, difficult decisions or wrong decisions i took in the past um i'll say this without <laughs> any remorse uh yeah. the very first large uh, grant that we got which is probably large was from you win we got seven million from you win at that time and for me um i was still in i was still in the in 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 in, in, in the i was still working when i got that because on uh, Agro that was on the side as a hobby, as a side business for me. And um, I never thought it could become big. So I was still doing my normal work. And um, we got this funding from the federal government of Nigeria. Um, we applied like a joke. It was joke, 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 joke. And we got to the finance and um, 
I, I, I actually requested for three million because I couldn't believe that um, any business could what you win. You win was um, between one million and ten million. So when yeah. I put in, I asked for three million because I couldn't believe that any business ten million is too much now. What am I going to do? Yeah. So, but I was surprised when I pitched it at the Lagos Business School where I pitched, and uh, when we went to Abuja to do the finance, those guys were wondering, "You could do this? You need more than three million." So they gave me seven million. <laughs> surprisingly and sometimes this is a learning curve for us to know when you don't have a mechanism of using the resources when you're not prepared mm. to use it you're going to waste it mm. you have to build your capacity to the point that you are ready to mm. be equipped and you uh, use that resources well mm. if you are managing hundred thousand us dollars for example and you've never in your in your experience or in your life or your activities mm -hmm. manage a million dollars if you get a million dollars you're likely to blow it but if you have built your capacity you might not have used it but you have built your capacity you have done your homework and you are ready for that one million dollars if it comes you will use it smoothly so at that time my capacity was probably less than a million but i projected myself at three million but i got seven million and the first mm -hmm. thing i did i didn't actually use the money and waste it like that in quotes I thought I was doing the right thing. I thought that was the right thing. Um, we got an office in Badon, a three-bedroom office, a flat, because mm. we wanted to get NAFDAQ. So NAFDAQ wanted us to get a, an apartment that is fenced. But I, mm. I overblew it. We put AC, mm. we put a lot of things. I made myself the MD. I had a wonderful office. I have a DSTV in my office. I had everything going. Now, I forgot that I'm in the rural area. The farm is in the same, but the office is in Ring Road in the Badon. Now, all activities suction around Ring Road. I forgot about the people in the forest. I forgot about increasing our, uh, uh, our capacity down there, which we actually increase our production. I, I, rem I retained the five acres of land I was using. I had about 150 boxes of honey. I left it like that. The whole first grant, first tranche of the money, 2.1 million, was on what they call paparazzi, making it like a brand. <laughs> it was, it worked because we got NAVDAQ, uh, we got trademark, we did the barcode, we did everything that we need to do to become a manufacturing company. But mm. we forgot the source. Mm. So at the time we started getting orders, we couldn't meet orders. Mm. And um, something came to me, like it would come to everybody that had done agricultural business for agricultural uh, agri food business before you would think of how you can shorten the gestation of that natural process because mm. you want to make more money i have a friend in zatek in those days when we were in school and he always yeah. tell me that people always think how can they manufacture eggs well how can they, they don't want to wait for that bird to lay it again is that something they can do to if you know about poultry incubators we use 21 days to hatch yes. the chicken egg. Yes. The only difference the incubator is bringing is that it can hatch 1 million, it can hatch oh. 20 million. But it will go through the same natural process same. that God has yes. given. That the mother hen will sit on 10 eggs for 21 days. There is no science that will turn that thing around. So in agriculture, you have to be patient. You have to know that there's a natural process to follow. You can't mm. shorten it. You can only make it better in the way you can mm. make the process effective. You cannot mm. find a way of when you shot it there are people that shot it in the genetic modified stuff mm. and all these things but that's mm. another thing entirely uh for me it's not my thing um yeah. i don't go into too much of um, yes. manipulation that causes a lot of other things it brings a lot of other things so what i'm saying is i i i took some wrong decisions mm. and um the resources that were supposed to be uh, multiplied got depleted and it got to a point in which the business actually nosedived. And um, we were sourcing for honey from different areas. We went to different localities to be buying honey from people. And we didn't know the source of this honey. We were bottling it. We became more like a bottler because we have not that number. We're just, we're not interested in what we produce again because what we produce is so small. We wanted to scale quickly so along the line some of the people we supply we have the diabetic people that will supply some of them rely on our products uh we, we we couldn't check 
the source of our um, where we're getting this these things we couldn't verify so we bought the wrong thing and um we sold the wrong thing to the to, to one of our customers and this actually boomerang and um, mm. we got to a stage we have to shut down business and i have to think of what to do again with my life uh, mm. we shut down operations for roughly six months in which we wow. went back to the uh, rural area to build more boxes and start wow. afresh uh, mm. because that is the source so mm. if you are thinking of doing anything on agriculture you need to have patience and you need to have maybe other source of income pending the time that the uh, business will come to life uh, mm. if you if you get money now and you plant cassava for example for the next nine months are you not going to eat so agricultural business needs time it needs a lot of inputs you're going to need to maintain the farm, maintain every other thing. So that's one learning curve. The other one is we have issues in which uh, there has been attack on the farm. There's one recently, and um, there are cases of theft, uh, cases in which people go to there. They discover we're having only on our farm, bees on our farm, and they use fire. They throw fire into the farm deliberately, uh, oh. chase away all the bees, harvest all the honey, and burnt all the boxes. Wow. Once you burnt our box, that's the head. It's a wooden box. So, but the good thing is, we were able to come back in those things and devise means of uh, avoiding. And anytime we had issues, challenges, and we come back, we we're able to divide way. And this smart hive, uh, the smart hive is not um, protected against theft. But if you do anything on the smart hive, if you touch it, put your hand on it, it will show on the system right now. Anything you do around there, we could know. And we're also working with some other inventors uh, that we met during the eye fair, uh, which we can actually help with um, monitoring the farm area now because of insecurity. We're working on um, detecting the movement on the, on, on the farm using artificial intelligence and um, some other applications, which we believe will help. So um, there will be downtime. There will be downtime. There will be time in which uh, you feel like living and uh, using the Nigerian word Jakwa. <laughs> I've thought of Jakwa several times and then yeah. let me go back to the UK or go elsewhere and um, start my life afresh. But the good thing is, um, if you look at look back at what we've been able to achieve, uh, if you look at the rural areas, the, your impact in the rural areas, what, are, what people have benefited from you. Because when we started, we were begging the farmers to take the boxes from their farm because we used their farmlands. We needed to, to spread. And they were saying, no, we don't want. But now, we have applications. Mm. People are saying, please, we need the boxes. We don't sell the boxes to the small other farmers. We give to, the, to them, not for free. We give mm. to them with a partnership deal. You okay. sign a partnership agreement that you're not going to touch our hives. You're going to leave the hives there. You're not going to use too much of chemicals. You're going to follow our instructions on how to use chemicals. You're going to right. become a fruit and vegetable farmer along with what you are doing because if you have cassava on your farm and you put boxes there let me be sincere to you work. the bees will run away they will run away because cassava doesn't have flour yeah the maize has flourish but the the, 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 the the fruity part of it is so small so you need fruit and vegetables so what what the farmers get in return is that they get a percentage on every harvest for example okay. some get as much as 20 percent so that means if we take 100 liters of honey from you, you are getting 20 liters, which you can use for yourself or sell back to us immediately and get cash. So, and in the long run, once you're in our network, we supply with hybrid seedlings of fruit and vegetables at a reduced price, uh, give you free, um, what they call agronomic advice and advisory, uh, advice, advisory system to grow it. You don't need to go and learn it. We'll teach you. We have people that will teach you how to do it. So in the long run, the farmers make money from us. So now it's beneficial. So if one look at this and uh, you are happy with what you are doing, then you have the staying power. Uh, the passion for what you are doing and the impact you are making will overshadow all the other challenges and you want to continue. Uh, I'm looking forward to being able to scale this uh, thing beyond your state. Uh, we are actually in Ogun State now. We've piloted in Ogun State, and uh, we want to go to Oshun. We want to spread and see how we can help 
to um, improve the food productivity. Uh, it's not about just producing, as I said, how productive, how, how efficient is our production? Can we produce on per acre and be comparable to other places in the world? Uh, if you take your time to Google and see our production uh, productivity, you'll be shocked we are not doing anything. Our production uh, is probably the lowest in the whole world. Uh, on on one acre, how many cassava do we? How many tons of cassava do we produce? How many tons of maize do we produce on one hectare of land? So our mission in AgroData is to increase this productivity. It's not about just running on a treadmill and be sweating. Well, you are doing well, but you're not moving. We want to be able to move. We want the farmers, we want people to see agriculture as a business. The farmers should be able to be proud and um, happy that they're making money. They should be able to send their kids to good schools with their investments. That's the mission awesome. of AgroData. Awesome. Now, to my last question. Now, this question has to do with um, legacy, um, multiplying yourself. Will you be open? Because, you know, when, when you have this proprietary uh, solution, idea, concept that have been able to work, that have gone beyond uh, most valuable product stage to something that's in the marketplace. Do you have a template, a blueprint, or a framework in place which people can follow? And it's like going through a curriculum. Now, you are you have a background in agric engineering, but you've been able to evolve with experience interfacing with different people. Um, traveling wide and now have this solution do you have a blueprint or framework in place now that anyone can say that okay this is a framework or a curriculum that's been developed by agrodata or that has been developed by olumide and if you go through this curriculum for maybe four weeks or three months or thereabouts you will understand the whole value chain. You understand the market place. You understand the economics, the financials, everything that you need to know to be in this space and be productive and be uh, sustainable and be thriving in this space. Do you have anything like that in place? <laughs> Larry, let, let me say this. I have to, <laughs> your questions are so deep and um, well thought of this is really 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 good um <laughs> thank you incidentally it's as if you spied into my into our notebooks <laughs> um <laughs> we 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 had plans to we have blueprints based on uh, the experimentation we've been doing because i have to tell you the truth there has been a trial and error for us uh -huh. Uh -huh. we know about different templates in the old in different parts of the world like the California experience I shared, uh, but yeah. we didn't have any tropical one to follow. Um, yeah. And for your information, we've we've been to Kenya because they are also uh, we've been to Tanzania. They produce honey, mm. and yeah. we are hoping. That's why if you look at our social media, the our user's name is AgroData for Africa. Uh, yes. We're hoping that before this year's runs out, we'll be able to launch out in Tanzania, and yeah. hopefully in Kenya as well. Now, looking at blueprints, we've been able to document. Um, the, the process and procedures and we are actually validating them now with the research institute we work close in and um close with nihot um some part of um Koko research because Koko research actually deal with cashew i made a recommendation to when i was in Koko research some uh, during two years ago people thought about Koko research as a research institute for Koko, but no it's three crops they actually do cashew. We get our cashew seedlings from them. I told them it should be train three crops research in of Nigeria. Because they do coffee. They do, I'm doing a free advert for them. <laughs> but because, because the way we do things in Nigeria, we don't harness our resources. We don't put this thing together. We just take one thing. Because at that time, cocoa overshadowed all those other three crops. So they just took cocoa and make it cocoa research. No. They do cashew, they do coffee, they do so many other things. So, for agro data, we've looked at the niche market of fruit and vegetables, and we've been able to come up about 10 
different fruit and vegetables that we can actually combine with this honey. And now looking at building capacity in these aspects, uh, we cannot hold on to an idea, we cannot hold on to a technology because it's actually God-given and the yeah. way to multiply is to sow, is to spread. Yeah. So yeah. We, we talked about this um, last year and we tried to launch the Beekeepers Institute, we call it DEN. Uh, but we mm. discovered that it did not scale because mm. we were so narrowed and um, we now discovered that there are other um, organizations that are doing training and they are doing very well. Uh, mm. They're not doing training, some are, some are so specialized now that they're doing training for agri. Um, a very good friend of mine, Tolu, uh, is as AgroLand. Uh, which is a learning platform for agricultural focus. So we're now working with these people to produce a curriculum that we can launch out to, to them and they can actually run on their platform. So when you run this curriculum online, you get the basics understanding. It's like learning how to drive in the UK. You have to go to yeah. uh, the theoretical part first and yeah. get the understanding of the rules and the regulation before you now go for your driving practice. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So what we are now doing now is we will not be able to run that training platform because it will be like uh, doing too many things and not specializing. Since we've been able to have our own uh, model of operation, we are increasing yeah. our own uh, way of doing things. Now, the curriculum we've de developed, the blueprint we developed, will now partner with these training guys, right. just like the way Coursera does. So they yes. will be able to run the online training. Now, right. the connection there is that the moment you complete the online training and you you had a pass mark you are fine everything is fine i now yeah. want to launch it into a business there's right. another organi another organization now that mm -hmm. helps startups it's like an incubation yeah a, a incubator or accelerator so yeah. there are about four or five of them are in nigeria now agri catalyst is there a lot of them so right. what they would now do is that you have an idea you have the online training now you want to launch it as a business what do you need to do to launch it as a business so they will come back to us and we'll supply all the necessary materials for example in-house now we make everything all the beekeeping accessories are produced by ourselves the beehive the bee suit the smoke gun everything including wow. the, the the centrifuge core, um, the processing what you need for your processing everything is being produced by us so we decided to be in that field and right. um, all you now need after the training to launch out is to go into this acceleration program which is more mm. of a practical incubator they will teach you the business model they will mm. teach you everything and be then all you need is probably an offtake um as in grants or probably mm. some someone to sponsor you which mm. you can get from people like tony lumelu and the rest if you have five thousand dollars today to start beekeeping business i can assure you multiply that in a year's time mm. if you do it well yes it's something that you could actually handle looking at our own learning curve all the mistakes we've done we've removed it from it you can actually scale with our own way of doing things awesome. so it, it's a it's a is our next um agenda to mm. partner with um training institutes like agro mm. land that i mentioned and also mm. to partner with um incubators that will actually take the idea because there's one thing to learn and there's one thing to be able to turn into a business we should not mm -hmm. do it the way we do our universities i'm sorry to say this i'm a product yeah. of university of Ibadan, and i'm happy with that land there but it's difficult these days to see a university graduates that will just come out from school and implement what it does or what yeah yeah. And that's why today now, yeah. University of Ibadan have the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, which is the enterprise harm of it. Yeah. I know in um, different schools, they are bringing it up now, uh, yeah. entrepreneurship. I know about uh, Joseph Abiyababala University, they have a wonderful entrepreneurship uh, department um, unit. So what we are trying to do is, the online training is for the basic knowledge, but the incubator or the accelerator will actually launch you out into doing the business. Our own part is to supply the curriculum and at the same time supply the materials. It's, it's, it, it's, it's not binding on anybody. You could do the online course for a fee and decide you're not doing it as a business. Uh, you could go ahead and go to the accelerator 
and uh, get equipped on how, how to run it as a business, then get the materials from us and launch out. So we are ready to to disseminate or spread uh, this idea to as much people as possible. We are not holding on to it. Uh, the more the merrier. Uh, the impact will only come when we eat millions. Uh, we will not be able to make impact if we remain in the corner of uh, yeah. where we are. Uh, and it doesn't have to be that uh, it has to be um, all financial gains alone. Um, yeah. We've seen a lot of people copy our ideas and I'm happy when I see it. Uh, when I see people talking about making honey and growing fruits and vegetables, they might not, it might not even be a copy from us, but at least um, we are spearheading it in Nigeria now and we want as much as possible people to go into it. it it's, it's going to be, um, it's like creating a value chain and um, uh, making the value chain more uh, productive. Uh, the more people that come into this field, the more fruit we get, the more honey we get. And hopefully, we can get forest from this. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lumide, for this Thank powerful you. session on the Mentors Lounge. It has been really, really explosive, very informative indeed. Um, and that's it. Um, do you have a final note? For us, before we round up this day. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, I would like to say this that um, if you have interest in doing one thing, it might not be agriculture. Uh, passion actually drives life, drives businesses. Because if you do it because of the monetary gain alone, what if there's a downtime and you lose the money or something? You will not have the staying power. But if you have passion for it, if you are interested in doing something, people like some people like working with kids. They teach and they hand 10,000, 15,000 a month. But surprisingly, they are very happy with what they do. If you take it as a work or as a job, it becomes difficult. You look at it as 9 to 5. But if you take it as what you like doing, it's like making your hobby a work. Yeah. You're fun, you're happy. For me, going to the rural area, working with the farmers is a natural thing for me. If I don't do it yeah. in a week, I'll be sick. So I'm, I'm not forced to go to the rural area. I'm not forced yeah. to go and meet farmers. Nobody's going to tell me, ah, you didn't go to the farm today because I like to go there. In fact, yeah. some of my pictures are released online. You'll see me in the bee farm without a bee suit. Oh. If it's on my own farm, it's like keeping a dog. If you raise a dog from puppy, no matter how big it becomes, he will always play with you. People have tried this with other animals, like tiger, like lion. They raise them, and people keep even snakes. Now the bees are not harmful; they are lovely. They sting. If they sting, they die. <laughs> That's another thing. So they don't want to die. So you could do these things. Your passion. Follow your passion. Is just what I'm trying to explain. Follow your right. passion. Follow anything right. that you like doing. Right. and make a business out of it. Uh, right. In this part of the world where we come from, we are not being told that we could make business from our, our play. We, we are being told that if you want to do business, you have to be street. No, you could be playful. TikTok today, I don't know what the, the business model of TikTok. TikTok is for what? To play more. <laughs> to create content to play. And they are making a huge impact and making money for themselves with that platform. So don't yeah. think of creating solution with your tie and suit no anything you can find pleasurable mm. anything you can find amazing something you like doing without being forced yeah put much uh, effort into it and you could turn it into a business thank, thank you. you so much Olumide. thank you so much that's it on the mentors lounge today thanks for watching thanks you to Olumide who has really really shared a great insight with us today until the next episode it is me larry louise signing out thank you very much